The start tonight, I've mentioned a couple times the last couple weeks that, that people count how many phrases in Revelation start with the word blessed. And I never really thought about this this way, but we've seen th- three of them so far, I think. Almost right at the beginning, Revelation 1 verse 3 said, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take the heart what's written in it, because the time is near. And so people are blessed if they listen to what God had written down in this book of Revelation. We have another one in Revelation chapter 14. I heard a voice from heaven say, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit. They will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. So according to that verse, who's blessed? The people who die, with a little bit of a qualification. Which people who die? With faith in the Lord. Yeah, blessed are the people who die with faith in the Lord. The third one we had, right toward the end last time, the words from Jesus, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. We ended by talking about what that verse means. But who's blessed according to Jesus in that verse? The person that watches. The person that watches. The person who's ready for Jesus to come again. Okay, we're going to see another blessed phrase today. This is we go through Revelation. I've begun to appreciate how there's a lot of scary things and big visions and Bad things that happen, but God makes sure we don't go too long without something good. And there's just a cycle of, yeah, watch out, this is what's going to happen, but don't worry, you're blessed. Don't worry, Jesus wins. Don't worry, here's what heaven looks like. And it's been neat to see that pattern as we go through. Here is our, oh, one more thing from last time. We talked about Armageddon last time, which is one well-known word from Revelation. Do you remember what Armageddon, the word itself, means? Hey, Scott's good. Thanks for bailing everybody out, Scott. <laughs> That's good. Mountain of Megiddo. Or Mount Megiddo. And so we said the word, it's kind of interesting that the Bible uses it this way. Megiddo is just a little town that was in Israel. There is a mountain there, although, I don't know, it's more like an Oklahoma mountain than a real mountain, right? Other places. It's just kind of like a hill. There were a lot of big battles that were fought there in Bible times because there was so much space around it for armies to gather. That's just what it means, Mount Megiddo, the mountain of Megiddo. Do you remember what we said it stands for? This Armageddon. What about the end? And what specific thing that's going to happen at the end? It's a little more specific than just the end. What did you say? The battle. battle. So Armageddon is this battle at the end. And so we heard at the end of chapter 16, everybody around the world is called to fight at this battle of Armageddon. And it's what the Bible told us. This is the battle at the end. And remember when we ended last time, how does how does the battle go? There really isn't no battle. Because God wins. It's kind of this call that all the enemies of God gather and bring all the weapons you have and rally everybody you can and then Jesus wins. Without even there being a big fight. That, that's what gives us confidence as Christians. We see we see everybody gathering, right? We see forces of evil and oh boy, how's this gonna go? And, Revelation tells us, yeah, it's true. It's going to happen. It's going to be this big gathering of forces against God. But don't have any doubt about how it's going to go. You already know how the battle ends. Here's our big review sheet. So, I think all of you are familiar with this. We've made it all the way through these seven bowls. So just a quick review of where we've gone. We saw Jesus as the King of Kings. We had letters to seven churches. We had these seven seals that only Jesus the Lamb could open. Then we had seven trumpets, all bringing kind of disasters on the world. We had a couple of different interludes. The first one was really nice because we saw the people in heaven in the white robes and 144,000. 
The second interlude was a little bit strange. John had to eat a scroll. It was like John was being commissioned to go share God's word. And then there were these two witnesses who went around and despite fierce opposition, they proclaimed God's word and then they got killed and then everybody rejoiced that they were dead and then they rose from the dead. And it seems to be God telling us that no matter what happens, his word is going to be shared. There's going to be witnesses for Jesus. We had seven different visions. And then last time we read these seven bowls, or the seven plagues, which were a lot like the seven trumpets. And it was describing plagues that are going to come on the earth before the end. And so far we made it. And some of you have your sheep filled up even better than mine is, which is impressive. More information on it. If we zoom out a little bit, all that's left is at the bottom here. And you can see the person who made the sheet didn't have anything creative to say about the last chapters. All right, just 17, 18, 19, 20 to 22. And so we've gotten to the point in the book where we're reaching the conclusion. So there's not going to be any more series of seven things. It's not going to be a whole bunch of events that we have to keep track. Now we're going to see the culmination of things, the culmination of God's judgment and the, the culmination of salvation. So if you're going to fill in your sheet, these last chapters, just kind of write in general what each chapter is about as we get toward the end and, and see how everything it gets summarized and concluded. We're in Revelation 17. So we'll start reading there. And we're going to hear about this picture, a lady riding on a big beast. So Revelation chapter 17, I'll read verses 1 to 8. As I do, just think to yourself, what's familiar? We're going to hear about some creatures that we're used to, that we've heard about before. There's going to be a few things that are new. And so keep in mind, what, what haven't we witnessed before? What's new? Here we go. Revelation 17. One of the seven angels who had the seven bulls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by many waters. With her the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet, was glittering with gold, precious stones, and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand, filled with the abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. The name written on her forehead was a mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. Then the angel said to me, Why are you astonished? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast she rides, which has the seven heads and ten horns. The beast, which you saw, once was, now is not, and yet will come up out of the abyss and go to its destruction. The inhabitants of the earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world, will be astonished when they see the beast because it once was, now is not, and yet will come. So that's the latest scene that we get to see about the future, the latest vision. What's familiar? What about all this? Do you say, I've heard that before? The heads. The heads. Yeah, so there's this thing with with seven heads and ten horns on one of the heads. That's familiar. Right? What beast is this? There's the beast of the sea and the beast of the land. This is the beast of the sea. So we've seen this beast since Revelation chapter 13. And it's the one with seven heads and ten horns on a head. Okay, that's familiar. What else is familiar? Anything else? There's a phrase that 
that's familiar? What's the phrase that's repeated about this beast? A phrase that we've heard for God. He once was. Yeah. Now it is not yet. Good. Does that sound familiar? Okay. A similar phrase was used for, for God, right? When was and whiz and whiz to come. And it seems, remember, that this beast is evil, of course. He's trying to act somewhat like God. He's trying, He's trying to take, a, be God, exactly. He's trying to be God. Good. You're not finding a lot of things that are familiar, are you? All right, what's new? What haven't we seen before? The woman. We haven't seen this woman before. We saw a different woman. It's obviously not the same one. The woman we saw in Revelation chapter 12 was a good, a good God-fearing person symbolizing the Christian church. This is not that. The blasphemous names. Blasphemous names. We heard something similar in chapter 13 with the beast, but it might be phrased a little bit differently here. So it's got blasphemous names. All right. On the next slide, we're going to point out a few things. So this woman is called a prostitute. Right? We've talked about this a little bit. The picture isn't so much about sex necessarily. What's, what's the picture? Why is she called a prostitute? She's unfaithful to whom? To God. Okay, and so when it talks about adultery, you know, physical adultery is a sin. But the reason it's being described this way is this is unfaithfulness to God. People have been unfaithful to God. They've run, run after other gods. All right? The beast we talked about, that's the beast of the sea. Do you remember what the beast of the sea seems to symbolize throughout Revelation? Not Satan. Who's Satan in Revelation? The red dragon is Satan or the devil. So this great beast, you said it, Dave. So like political forces or government forces or human authority. That's the corrupt. Beast. That's the beast. It's human authority and power that's used against God and against God's church. Right? So that beast of the sea is the one that carries through. This hasn't changed for six or eight chapters. We see this beast pop in. It symbolizes the same thing. Corrupt human authority that's being used against God and against his church. Isn't the dragon red also? The dragon's red. Yeah. So there's a lot of similarities. And actually when we see the dragon, it's described as having seven heads also. And so we, we think this beast is connected to the devil. He gets his power from the devil. He kind of looks like the devil. It makes sense. Yeah. All right, Babylon the Great. So this this lady has this name on her forehead. But we've heard this before, Babylon the Great. Why are God's enemies called Babylon? This is going back to the Old Testament, that Babylon was the foreign nation that conquered Jerusalem and dragged God's people into exile. Babylon became the symbol of this is the enemy of God, Babylon. In John's day, Babylon wasn't an enemy anymore. Nobody cared about Babylon. But there was kind of another city that had taken Babylon's place. In John's day, what would he have thought of when he wrote Babylon the Great? Rome. He would have thought of Rome. Rome was this place where there were emperors actively persecuting Christians. And who did the emperors want you to worship? Themselves. There was this emperor cult. Worship us. We're the real God. And so, by the time of John, it was like Rome had replaced Babylon. But the same word is used, Babylon the Great. And it's, it's meant to refer to the enemies of God in whatever form they take, in whatever age they are. In 600 BC, it was the Babylon, Babylonians who lived in Babylon. Would and, Babylon still, the connotation of that Babylon still be very near to what the Jews, the absolutely. Jews of Israel? It seems like already in the Bible, the people of Israel are attaching the name Babylon to whoever their enemy is. 
And so, again, in John's day, nobody cared one bit about Babylon. It actually was completely deserted, and there's nothing there. Like, there's no city of Babylon from long ago already. But they would have used the word Babylon. They would have thought about Rome. Rome had taken the place of Babylon as this foreign power that really is fighting against God and what God seems to be doing. And so when we hear Babylon the Great, this is the title for God's enemies. Starting with the Babylonians long ago, probably thinking about the Romans in in John's day, in Paul and Peter's day. And for us today, we don't think about the Babylon or Rome, but we can certainly think of forces of authority in our world that have fought against God and his church. It's Babylon and the Great. Are you following that? Okay, the abyss. We heard about the abyss. What's the abyss another word for? Hell. Yeah. This is where the, the devil is confined and he comes from there and brings his forces from there. And finally, this phrase, inhabitants of the earth. Do you remember what the phrase inhabitants of the earth seems to especially be referring to? Unbelievers. Of course, just the words. I mean, every single person on earth is an inhabitant of the earth. But as we go through Revelation, it seems to especially be referring to the the unbelievers. And what are the unbelievers going to think about this beast? We look at the end of verse 8. How are the unbelievers going to feel about this beast? They're going to be amazed. They're going to be like, wow, this is a cool thing. Look at how much power this thing has. Look at what this can do. He once was, and he's not now, and he will be. And, right? This is a theme carried through Revelation too, that those who aren't in love with Jesus are going to really fall in love with the other ungodly forces in our world. They're going to think that those other forces are really where, where salvation is found. Do you follow all that? Right, so when I, when I was thinking, what's familiar? This was the list that I had in my mind. We've at least heard of these concepts before. All right, unbelief is described as adultery. Babylon the Great, this is the enemy. The, the beast is this beast of the sea. Okay? I know it's hard to keep all this in our minds, but I know it's been beneficial for me to go straight through the book Often as a pastor, you know, I preach on like one section and then the next week we're on to something else and I think it's been really helpful to go straight through and we do see these, these things appear again and again. The same ideas, the same characters and creatures appear again and again. And so I think it is possible to become familiar with this is what this means. This is what it's showing me. So the woman is riding him because they are together. They're together. Exactly. We're going to talk about this, this woman, the prostitute, a little more as we go on. But clearly, these are two, two forces of evil who are working together. John? The two forces of evil are the beast. The beast and this prostitute, this woman. And we're going to hear a little bit more of a description of both of them. And then after that, we'll say who it really sounds like it is. But for now, these are two forces joining together against God's people. But before we go on, we said there's, there's always little promises in here. So look again at verse 8. It says, The beast which you saw once was, now is not, and yet will come up out of the abyss and go to its destruction. The inhabitants of the earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world, will be astonished when they see the beast, because it once was, now is not, and yet will come. A lot of bad things are there. But there's one really beautiful thing. Who was talked about right in the middle of that verse? The people who have the names in the book of life. There's people whose names are written in the book of life. Have we heard about the book of life already in Revelation? Absolutely. This adds a phrase. How long have those names been written in the book of life? Since creation. Yeah, since the creation of the world. Right, what, is that, what is that saying to you? God knew you before you were born. He knew every hair on your head. 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 Even the changing number of them, right? <laughs> it goes up and down, depending on the day and the color. 
into it. God knows this. And, you know, again, as we go through the end times, just when, as we go through a person, it kind of seems like, where, where is this going to end up? Where is this going? What's going to happen? And the book of Revelation wants to remind you, but not only does God know how it's going to end, but God knows your part in it. And God chose you to believe in Jesus. Here's a passage from Romans. Romans chapter 8. Sorry, verse 28. It says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love and will be called according to his purpose. Look at these, this series of steps it describes. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. And yet, sometimes we, you know, we'll say all that with, God saved me. But it spelled, what did God do? He, he knew you. He foreknew you. He knew you before. And then he predestined you, which is how the Bible talks about God knows who the believers are going to be even before the beginning of the world. But he didn't stop there. Then he, then he called us. And you think of how we were each called in different ways, maybe through baptism, maybe through hearing God's word, that faith in Jesus. And then those he called, he also justified, which is that powerful word about Jesus taking our sins away and declaring us not guilty in God's sight. And those he justified, he also glorified. And I think with that we think about one day we'll be in glory in heaven, but even here on earth, God's given us Jesus' righteousness. And you just look at this is all this that God has done for us. And so as we see about these enemies of God's people and God's church, you remember, but but there's a book of life. And God's got names written in there. And your name's in there. And my name's in there. And look at what God has done for us. This is what, me, what leads us to say, we know in all things God works for the good of those who love. Because we've seen what God's already done for all of us. Ready to go on? All right, verse 9. So we got this lady riding on the beast. And we're going to hear more about it. Verse 9, this calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. They are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come, but when he does come, he must remain for only a little while. The beast who once was and now is not is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. The ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. They will wage war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will triumph over them, because he is the Lord of lords and King of kings, and with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. Then the angel said to me, The waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. The beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it in their hearts to accomplish his purpose by agreeing to hand over to the beast their royal authority until God's words are fulfilled. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. Hmm. There's a lot of stuff in here. Huh? All these numbers. And... Uh, Hopefully, if you've been coming, you're going you're gonna to realize we're not going to try to say exactly what every one of these numbers and things is talking about. But let's talk through them and see what we can say. Oops. So, first of all, we're, we're told that the seven heads are seven hills. And that makes us definitely think of one thing. Rome. The city of Rome was known as the city of seven hills, in its own words. So Roman writers would talk about, we're the city of seven hills. And so it seems like that is just making this connection, this idea, Babylon the Great, the enemies of God. In John's day, that was really personified by the city of Rome and these Roman emperors who fought against God. 
What I think is really striking is that the seven heads don't just stand for seven hills. <laughs> then it says there are also seven kings, which this is apocalyptic literature. And the Bible is saying, you know what, sometimes a symbol means more than one thing. Maybe it means different things at different times. Which is what makes us cautious to say, well, this means this, right? So these seven heads, they make us think about how Rome has seven hills. It says they also make us think about seven kings. And here is where, if you were to read commentaries on Revelation, you could find a million different combinations of seven things that could be these seven kings. And so one popular thing to do would be to look at the list of Roman emperors and to try to say, well, which seven Roman emperors could fit these seven kings? And maybe you could guess, there were a lot more than seven Roman emperors. And so there's, there's no combination of them that fits nicely with how it's described. Others will look at kingdoms of the world and try to line up, well, what would be seven kingdoms of the world that would fit? Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, and Egypt. And, but again, it really doesn't seem like it's, it fits the way that we want it to fit. And so maybe the best thing, these seven heads, if they stand for seven kings, who have we been saying all along that this beast stands for? Human authority, right? And so it makes perfect sense that the heads on it stand for human authorities. And I don't know that we're able today to say, well, these seven kings, five who were, one who is not, one that's coming, I don't know that we with confidence can say, well, we know exactly who these seven are. But, but it fits with the message of this beast. This is secular human authority. It's very powerful. Working against God. You follow that? This Christ who once was and now is not. And I read something that was really helpful for me. It, one, it's, it's this beast claiming to be like God. Right? The only difference is that there's not the, the not with God. With God it was, is, will be. With the beast it was, is not, will be. So there's this trying to be God, claiming to be God. But then also this idea, if we're thinking of this beast as fierce secular authority that wars against God's people, isn't it true in history that it's kind of, it was, it isn't, it will be, there's this off and on thing that happens. Isn't that true about how history goes and even the powers of the world go? There is no one secular authority that lasts forever. The Roman Empire was hostile to Christianity for a long time, but the Roman Empire didn't last forever. Eventually the emperors actually became Christian, but then the, the empire itself fell apart. Right? There's been no human authority that's lasted forever. It's good for us to remember in America, because sometimes we act, right? Like, well, our country is going to be the one that's always going to be around. And, uh, that's doubtful, right? Pretty doubtful that's going to happen. This is how it works with secular authority. Right? It is. It's not. It is again. Right? It's here. Then it moves over there. Then it's over there. And so that, that was helpful for me as you think about this beast, this enemy of God's people. This is what it's going to be like. Sometimes that beast is going to be very clear and obvious and powerful. Sometimes he's not. But then he'll be there again. Clear and powerful and again, and then not. I think if you just look at the history of the world, that's, that's kind of how it's been. There'll be fierce leaders against Christianity, and then there won't be for a while. And then there won't be. And there won't be. Alright? Does that help and explain that phrase? A couple more things. So he's got the ten horns. And those are ten kings. If you look at how they're described in verse 12, it says, The ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received the kingdom. And so it makes it sound like, well, these are also authorities, but they're not quite as powerful, whereas important. And you kind of almost have this hierarchy. You've got these heads, which really seem to be powerful kings, and then you've got these horns, which they're also authority, but maybe not quite as powerful. And then how long do those ten horns get to reign? One hour. One hour, which, you know, we've learned from time. 
It's not just saying one literal hour, but one hour isn't very long, right? And so there's going to be other forces. You've got the seven heads, which are kings, who are going to exert power. And then there's these ten horns, which are also going to be kind of like little kings, and they're going to exert power too. And maybe there's won't last as long. And again, you just, just look at how the world works, and you see this. There's, there's some really big powers that really do damage to Christianity. And then they put in power some little powers. And they do that too. And just this, all this authority working together against God is people. Okay, so if you're waiting for me to tell you, well, these are the exact ten kings symbolized by the ten horns. We're not going to do that. But I think it's helpful to see how this all fits in the big picture of authority working against God. The last question I have is why? What are all these authorities trying to do? You look at <coughs> verses 13 and the start of verse 14. Wage war against the land. They're trying to build up the power of the beast to wage war against the land. And so whoever these people are and whatever they symbolize probably changes as we go through history. The goal stays the same. They're trying to build up this secular power against God and we want to wage war against the Lamb. Who wins? The Lamb. The Lamb wins. All right, good. You, you learned something in this book. This is good. Okay, so the big picture, I think we've talked a lot about the beast. Somebody explain for me who this beast is and what he symbolizes. Secular power and government throughout history. At one point, that was Babylon. At the time of the Book of Revelation, that was Rome. But the promise is this is going to continue. Secular authority and power used against God's people is going to continue until, until the Lamb comes back and puts an end to it. Okay, what we haven't spent time talking about is this woman, the prostitute. Uh, who are, who's missing in the picture? So, we know the dragon, the devil, he's behind everything. We've got this beast of the sea. Who's the third bad thing? The beast of the earth. This is the extra credit question. Do you remember last time who the beast of the earth was called? What name? It seems like this beast of the sea, once we're introduced to him in Revelation 13, we see the same picture in the rest of the book. But the beast of the earth changes. In chapters 15 and 16, we hear about the beast of the, the sea, and then we hear about the false prophet. And so it seems like the beast of the earth is also the false prophet. Now we've got the beast of the sea, and we've got the prostitute, and so, are you following my line of thinking? Who does this prostitute make us think of? The beast of the earth. Now, do you remember what we said the beast of the earth symbolizes? What kind of power? Spiritual. Spiritual power. So we have this one beast that is secular authority, kings and powers. The other beast, right from the start, we said symbolizes religious authority that also works against Christianity and works against Christ. If you just think about that, that fits, that's the beast of the land, does that fit with being a false prophet? Absolutely. And how this prostitute's described, what, what is this prostitute trying to get people to do? What does a prostitute try to get people to do? Sin. Commit adultery. She's trying to get people to commit adultery, just not again in the physical. What kind of adultery? Spiritual. Spiritual adultery. Okay, does that fit with False religious authorities trying to pull people away from Jesus. All right? And so here, this prostitute fits along with this picture of we've got three evil forces. We've got the dragon and the devil. We've got the beast that's secular authority. And then we've got the beast that's false religions, even sometimes false Christianity, working against Christ and his church. The beast of the earth tried to get people to worship the beast of the sea. Damn. Exactly. 
So in chapter 13, the beast of the earth is trying to get people to worship the beast of the sea. And we talked a little bit then, a couple weeks ago, about how sometimes false religion works together with the government to pull people away from God. And in Revelation time, this is how it's going to work. They're working together. False religion and secular authorities work together. We listed some examples a couple weeks ago, but if you think about anybody who's had a lot of physical power on earth, usually combines it with some kind of a religion. Right? You know, the Roman emperors did. They were the physical power, and then they made up their own religion of worshiping me. And so those two forces, earthly power and spiritual authority, work together to wage war against Christ and his people. Does that make sense? We talked about their goal. Just a couple more thoughts on this. So we said that this beast of the earth, who symbolizes false religion, is the one that changes. Beast of the earth, false prophet, prostitute. Why isn't it surprising that the beast who symbolizes false religion is always changing? They have no foundation. Isn't this exactly how false religion works? Yeah. You know, and the, the earthly power side. Earthly power looks about the same all the time, right? There's always people, especially men, who try to, you know, just control everything. That looks the same throughout history. But false religions, they take lots of different shapes, yeah. right? And so it, it makes perfect sense that this, this picture of false religion leading people away from God, it changes constantly. You know, when Lutherans in the Reformation time looked at this, they would have thought immediately of the Catholic Church. Because the Catholic Church was putting people to death for saying that they believe in Jesus as their saint. And the Catholic Church is this prostitute leading people away from God. That's still true today. The Pope still says terribly unchristian things that lead people away from Jesus. And so we can still see that, but it changes, doesn't it? I think maybe here in our area, it's not so much the Catholic Church, but it's this idea of God is love and do whatever you want to do and acceptance and doesn't matter what... This is how false religion works, right? It's constantly changing and shifting and it looks this way, this place, this way, that place. This is how it's described in Revelation. Right? Well, there's this false prophet. And then, oh, it's a prostitute. Oh, it's a, it's a beast from the earth. This is what, what false religion does. And, and maybe know that it's always the most dangerous the closer it looks to true Christianity. And so even with that beast of the earth, remember, that was the one that looked like a lamb but had the voice of a dragon. And so with false religion, there's always this, the closer that we can go to actually sound like real Christianity, the better chance we have to pull people away. Okay, one example, if we have enough time, I'm going to play some music for you at the end. But only if you're good and we have enough time. Uh, but I was looking for a song that, I don't want to give away what song it was, and I typed it as a Christian solo. And if you type Christian songs into YouTube, do you know what usually is the top thing that pulls up? The Mormon Tabernacle Choir. Because the Mormon Tabernacle Choir is world famous and sings lots of Christian songs. It's just there's a problem with the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. They're not Christians. Mormons deny that Jesus is God and the Savior of the world. And you just think, I can't... I want, to, I want to hear this Christian song, but I don't want to hear you singing it. Because you've gotten as close to Christianity as you can on the outside, while completely changing what the message is on the inside. And Mormonism is growing faster than just about any other religion in the whole world. And you think this is false religion, constantly shifting and changing, pretending to be as close to the truth as it can, pulling old people away from Jesus. Isn't it also true, though, that the, the Mormons have a higher suicide rate? I don't know. I know that there's a lot of Mormons struggling with a lot of things. There's a lot of Christians struggling with a lot of things too, right? 
And I know our, our Lutheran missionaries who reach out to Mormons really focus on that. Mormonism tells people you have to be perfect and it doesn't provide a solution. You have to be perfect. And that leads a lot of people to despair. And what we can say is, yeah, God commands us to be perfect. But that's why he sent Jesus. And it's through faith in Jesus that we get salvation. One more weird thing. So at the end of the chapter, it says that the beast hates the prostitute. So they're working together. This lady is riding on the beast. And then all of a sudden at the end, the beast doesn't like the prostitute now. Why would the beast, corrupt human authority, begin to hate the prostitute, corrupt religious authority? So, just a practical reason, this is exactly how it works. People in power use religion until what point? They don't need it anymore. They don't need it anymore. And then what do they do? They hate it. Not just they stop, they, they hate it. They want to get rid of it. Okay, so once again, I think this fits exactly with what we've seen happen in the world. People in power are going to use religion to their own ends. And in the moment that it isn't serving their ends anymore, then they're going to get rid of it. Okay, and so this kind of fits with how we work it. It also shows how foolish it is when Christians think that using government is going to achieve the church's purposes. <laughs> right? I mean, maybe we can figure this out. Government is not going to achieve the church's purposes. It could achieve its purpose. God has a good purpose for government. It's a good thing. But it's not going to achieve the church's purpose of sharing the gospel and leading people to Christ. Okay, we're going to be used until we're not needed, and then we'll get kicked out. And this is what happens. Like usual, there's some good things. Who's always in control? Yeah, so, I, so I asked, why did the beast start to hate the prostitute? Here's the Bible's answer. For God put it into their hearts to accomplish his purpose. At what moment does secular authority turn against false religions? God says so. When God says so. And so even the forces of evil, even the bad things happening in our world, don't think for a second God isn't in control. And the moment God's done using someone to accomplish his purpose, well, he'll make an end to it. God's the one who's in control. And even better than that, who wins? Jesus does. We skip this verse. They will wage war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will triumph over them because He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and with Him will be His called, chosen, and faithful followers. So Jesus wins, but who wins with Jesus? We do. We do. His called, chosen, and faithful followers. This is a good thing. Ready to go on? Chapter 18. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice, he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling for demons and a haunt for every impure spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable animal. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. And I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. For her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she has given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Pour her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torment and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit enthroned as queen, I'm not a widow, I will never mourn. Therefore, in one day, her plagues will overtake her. Death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. In one sentence, what are all those verses saying? Exactly. Babylon is going to meet her demise. The enemies of God are going to meet their judgment. 
in a big way. Okay? That's what this whole chapter is going to be about. Did you notice something God calls His people to do? If you look back at verse 4, before this judgment that's coming on Babylon, the enemies of God, what does God call His people to do? Come out. Come out. Come out. Isn't, isn't that a good thing for us to see? Right? As Christians, we can't leave the world, but God is always calling us to don't, don't walk with them. Don't live like they do. Don't go along with that. Come away from worldly ways before it's too late. Right? Isn't that God's call to all of us? Another word would be to repent, right? Don't, don't be sitting with the unbelievers when judgment comes. Come out from them. We're going to keep going. So we're hearing about this judgment on, on Babylon, the enemies of God. It's going to be really descriptive about it. So, chapter 18, verse 9. When the kings of the earth who commit adultery with her and share her luxury see the smoke of her burning, they will weep and mourn over her. Terrified at her torment, they will stand far off and cry, Woe, woe to you, great city, you mighty city of Babylon. In one hour your doom has come. You see, three groups of people especially sad about this judgment. Who's the first group? Merchants. Kings. Kings. Oh, kings. Yeah, remember, we've talked about how the kings are working together against God, right? For them to say, oh, God's judgment is coming. The kings are upset about that. Next, verse 11. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones, and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, and scarlet cloth, every sort of citron wood and articles of every kind made of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble, cargoes of cinnamon and spice, of incense, myrrh, and frankincense, of wheat and ol- of wine and olive oil, of fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and carriages, and human beings sold as slaves. Who else is going to be sad? The merchants. Why are the merchants going to be sad? Can't make more money. Yeah. You can't make more money. Right? Verse 14, they will say, The fruit you long for is gone from you. All your luxury and splendor have vanished, never to be recovered. The merchants who sold these things and gained their wealth from her will stand far off, terrified at her torment. They will weep and mourn and cry out, Woe, woe to you, great city. Dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. In one hour, such great wealth has been brought to ruin. Now, let's make one more connection. So this prostitute, this woman, stands for false religion. How is she described? What does she have a lot of? Wealth. Wealth. Just don't miss this connection. This woman really stands for false Christianity or false religion. What's one of the things to watch for? Greed. Greed and wealth. And here she's all about this stuff. All right, just watch out for that. If ever a Christian church seems to be all about scarlet robes and all these fine things, they're not on the right side. Right? This isn't what God's people focus their lives on. One more group that's going to be sad. We're in the middle of verse 17. Every sea captain and all who travel by ship, the sailors and all who earn their living from the sea will stand far off. When they see the smoke of her burning, they will exclaim, Was there ever a city like this great city? They will throw dust on their heads and with weeping and mourning cry out, Woe! Woe to you, great city, where all who had ships on the sea became rich through her wealth. In one hour she had been brought to ruin. Rejoice over her, you heavens. Rejoice, you people of God. Rejoice, apostles and prophets, for God has judged her with the judgment she imposed on you. What's the third group of people who are going to be sad about the fall of Babylon? Sailors. Sailors. It seems to be connected to the merchants, just people who trade goods on the sea. They're going to be sad too. No more making money. You think the things the world is built on, which is power and money, they're going to be done away with. 
Is there a connection between them and government or human authorities for those people who traffic on the sea, the beast of the sea? That's a good question. So we have the beast of the sea, and is that why the sea is brought up? I didn't, I didn't even think about that. I don't know what to say. Good, good point. So the beast of the sea, and here all these people are, the merchants on the sea are going to be disappointed about it. I haven't thought that through. Yes, yeah, well, everybody's mourning. What do God's people do? Rejoice. Rejoice. Right? When it comes to God's judgment on the last day, that's where you see such a huge contrast between believers in God and, and the world. It's going to be the sad day when everything falls apart that we human beings build our lives on. But if our life is built on Jesus, we're going to say, yes, finally. Right? Rejoice. It's a little more. Verse 21, my, my heading says, the finality of Babylon's doom. 21, then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a large millstone and threw it into the sea and said, with such violence, the great city of Babylon will be thrown down, never to be found again. The music of harpists and musicians, pipers and trumpeters will never be heard in you again. No worker of any trade will ever be found in you again. The sound of a millstone will never be heard in you again. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. The voice of bridegroom and bride will never be heard in you again. Your merchants were the world's important people. By your magic spell, all the nations were led astray. In her was found the blood of prophets and of God's holy people of all who have been slaughtered on the earth. So what's the final sign of Babylon's judgment and doom in these verses? Nothing's going to be left. What's described? What does the angel do? Puts a millstone on the neck and throws it into the He throws a millstone into the sea. Does that make you think of something that Jesus said? It immediately made me think of something Jesus said. I'm not saying that there's a direct connection, but Jesus said this. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. He said, if you lead a believer in Jesus away from Jesus, that's bad. Right? And here's the worst thing possible that's going to happen to you. You're going to have this huge stone tied around your neck and thrown in the sea. And how is Babylon destruction described? Just like that. Right? Receiving this judgment that Jesus says comes on those who lead his people, his little ones, away from him. So on your chart, we had chapters 17 and 18. And the way that people usually describe those two chapters together, this is describing the ultimate destruction of God's enemies. Specifically of the, the false religions. We could think of like the Antichrist. John doesn't mention the Antichrist. But this prostitute false religion makes us think of the Antichrist this is the, the final doom for those ends. The beast of the sea and the beast of the earth, they're going to meet their doom. There's one enemy that we haven't heard about his final doom yet. Who would that be? The dragon. And that's what comes in chapter 20. Is we're still reserved. There's still, there's still an even bigger judgment coming, and that's going to be for the dragon. And here we see on the last day what the end will be for Babylon, for these forces of evil, whether secular or religious. And that's a good thing, but we don't want to end on that note. And so chapter 19 is really cool. And we don't have a lot of time. We're just going to read a couple of the verses. And like I said, I have a song to share with you. So chapter 19... How are God's people going to react to what we just heard? After this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for true and just are His judgments. 
He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And again they shouted, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. The 24 elders and the four living creatures, remember those guys? That's from a long time ago. They fell down and worshipped God who was seated on the throne and they cried, Amen! Hallelujah! And a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, both great and small. They heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, like the loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah! For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Stop there. When God's people see what happens, what do they say? Hallelujah. hallelujah. What does hallelujah mean? Praise God. Close. Oh. Very close. Praise the Lord. Oh, that's right. Praise the Lord. And if we were in the Old Testament, it would be Lord with all capital letters. Praise that special name for God. Praise the Lord. And that's what God's people say at the end of the world. Hallelujah. Why are they singing that? Because they're happy. Because yeah. they're happy. They have almost destroyed. God's one. The, yeah. the forces of evil. You said the devil's destroyed. Just wait a second. We got for a couple months, actually. <laughs> wait a couple months, and we'll hear about the devil being destroyed. But God's enemies are destroying. Right? Hallelujah. Did you know what song I was going to play for you? Hallelujah. Have you heard the Hallelujah chorus? Yeah. Well, but just we started with blessed phrase. Here's one more. Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's the fourth beatitude in Revelation. But here, let's see if this works. The Hallelujah Chorus. Have all of you heard the Hallelujah Chorus before? At some point? It's changing. There's so many different versions. Uh, this is kind of the old traditional version of it. So... It's sung by the Royal Choral Society. They sound pretty official, don't they? Let's see if this works.
going to say, that's what our choir is going to sing next time. Yeah. <laughs> 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 used to do Hammer's Messiah. I, that's what I was going to say. Mm-hmm. I played in the orchestra. Yeah. That's cool. It brings back a lot. That's so beautiful. My whole church growing up, the church choir would sing the whole Messiah yeah. every, every Christmas. And so you hear that? As a kid, I didn't appreciate it because it was so long. I didn't <laughs> like to sit through the whole thing. But now I, I do. Well, this is the secular so the Royal Choral Society, I have no idea. Okay. I'm guessing it's something in England that has some Christian roots, but isn't probably too Christian at the moment. Right. I, was, I was wondering if for the non-believers in that choir, yeah. how they would feel about something. Right? I mean, if you listen to it, but you know, maybe never really. it. The Hallelujah Chorus is from Revelation chapter 19. Yeah. The whole thing. This is just the words of Revelation put the song. Can you just think, imagine a time when the greatest musicians put their best energies into writing songs of praise to God. And that's that's what it was. George Frederick Handel wrote this whole Messiah, song after song, with very, very strong words pointing to Jesus as a Savior. And it's cool. Cool to hear it sung today. And it's usually sung at Christmas time, but this song, of course, has really nothing to do with Christmas. It's the song of praise to God for his ultimate victory. So, next week is Ash Wednesday, which is good. It's just we don't get to continue our Bible studies. And we didn't make it through Revelation, so we'll just finish after Easter. We won't have class the, the, the week after Easter. So we'll start up like, be like 10 days after Easter, that Wednesday. We'll have class, and we'll finish up Revelation by the end of the year. Hopefully quite a bit sooner than that. Are we doing Easter for kids? We are. Easter for kids will be March 25th. Saturday, March 25th. Why are you at me? And we can use all the help we can get. So if you're available, Saturday, March 25th. We'd love to have you help. Let's go to the prayer. Dear Jesus, we're thankful that you're the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We see again this picture of forces of evil fighting against you and against us. We also see again how how you win and there's no doubt about your victory. May the song of the saints and angels in heaven also be our song, even here on earth. We know that you've won. Hallelujah. May our lives be songs of praise to you. Lord, we pray that you bless our, our Lenten dinners and devotions that start next week. May a lot of people come for fellowship together, especially time in your word. Help us to appreciate all you've done to save us and then bring us back again after Easter to finish this book and the glorious pictures of heaven that are still waiting for us. Lord, we we want to be there. Keep us and those we love faithful to you until the day that you take us home. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.